uh, Mark, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Um, and so the topic I thought that could be of interest of some of you is um, what we, we, we expect to find in the future, in the, in, not in the tropical regions that you're not very familiar with, but uh, more like in the temperate regions. That's a, an icon of Portugal, the Bolain Tower in Lisbon. And so one of these days we expect that on the other side of the river we have some landscape like this, maybe, we don't know. So we have been studying the fish communities around and um, the results I'm going to present here today are on the effects that we've seen on those communities and how they uh, relate to the changes that we are seeing in the ocean. And of course that uh, we know these global changes have been a very hot topic uh, currently uh, for the good and bad reasons. It's a uncontrolled experiment that humans are doing with the oceans, um, but at the same time allow us to try to understand better how these marine systems work. And so this relationship about um, how these marine organisms respond to changes is um, in the center of many of the current research. And we all know and we are familiar with uh, uh, IPCC projections and um, uh, data showing what is happening in different, with different models on what is called the temperature anomaly that we are uh, showing today. And this is a common graph um, for the atmosphere. And uh, we also are familiar with this um, uh, joystick, no, not joystick, uh, hockey stick. Uh, <laughs> hockey stick, right. <laughs> not exactly the same. Uh, for um, when combining different types of data uh, from uh, ice sheets, from uh, tree rings, and also from uh, thermometers. Uh, there's been a lot, lot of contention issues, issues around that I'm not going to touch. But essentially, uh, and this is of course a, a landscape uh, or a landmark the paper of, uh, um, in 1998 showing that this um, is um, uh, currently um, much more intensified than it has been in the past. And in the oceans, there are lots of uncertainty because people have been looking at sea surface temperature, but then the effects that that has in the middle ocean and deep ocean are uh, actually uh, lots of unknowns, and that's why we have this very, very high uh, diversity or very high um, vari variability um, in uh, ocean heat content here in the first layers of the ocean. And then if, when you go to the deep ocean, there's a big unknown there. But anyway, you see this increasing trend uh, of uh, change in the, in, the, in the conditions in the oceans. And um, essentially what we, you would expect when we have these changes is that the organisms will respond to those changes. Um, and there are a little, uh, there are a number of these um, changes that could be um, particularly impacting several types of organisms, some of which are ectotherms, and so their internal physiology depends on the external uh, environment. <clears throat> and we know also that this uh, impacts things like growth rates, metabolism, behavior, uh, habitat requirements, the way that prey and, and, um, and uh, predators interact, movement patterns, and uh, so many other aspects. And so um, one of the things that we've been witness witnessing re recently is that um, populations are shifting in distribution. And these shifting patterns are varied throughout the globe, uh, but they have been recently documented for a whole range of different organisms. <clears throat> and the consequences of these shifts can be potentially very high when you think of such a simple thing like fisheries, because they could be um, in a way where in the near future, the current uh, patterns of um, management that we have in the ocean are going to have to be very different in trying to cope with uh, how, how these species are changing. And so um, the goal of, of our studies have been essentially trying to, on the first place, document these changes, because there, there's uh, some recent literature showing this, but um, back then when, when we started monitoring these communities, there were not too many studies around. Um, and uh, then trying to extrapolate some of these uh, data for a system which is data poor. So we don't have many long-term data on, on the fish communities, for instance. We have some recent data, but we don't know too, ma too much about what was uh, there in the ocean back then. But we try to model how these communities could um, be facing these changes in the last 50 years. Um, and so essentially we, we would like to, or we aim at try to contribute to the issue on um, what types of consequences we, we would expect in these temperate regions 
when looking at fish communities as a model. Um, and uh, Portugal is um, right here on the western coast of uh, Europe, and it's in one of the four aquelic regions, main aquelic regions of the world. And so aquelic regions are very interesting for several uh, aspects. One is that variability is already very high in these regions. Uh, but on the other hand, Portugal is on the northernmost um, influence of this um, aquelic region that it's mainly here on the, on the western coast of, uh, of Africa. And in, in um, going into specifics of the study area, so this is Portugal in the west coast of Europe, and then we work mainly on this marine park, which is about 30 kilometers south of Lisbon, and um, we've been monitoring the communities here for um, some time. So, we know that this region is important for a couple of reasons. Um, it's an important biogeographic transition zone where you would find that many species face their limits of distribution and you have a mixture of faunas. So you have faunas from Northern Europe that stop about there and you have faunas from the Mediterranean and Africa that also stop around there. So it's a very interesting case to try to analyze what uh, climate uh, variability can uh, influence, how they can influence these communities. There's also relatively high biodiversity because of local uh, aspects and also because of these fauna interchanges in the region when compar compared, of course, with other temperate regions throughout Europe. And so it's also an interesting uh, place because of this. Uh, and again, it's in the northern limit of the uh, northeastern Atlantic upwelling. To show you a little bit about um, water temperature and what you, you would expect, so this is uh, our study area. So you see that it's around 18 to 19 degrees temperature on average, uh, but actually near coast is much cooler because of the plowing system. So you have warmer waters offshore and cooler waters inshore, depending on conditions. And also um, these very straight lines, uh, one of the reasons why you have intensity of plowing is because the wind forcing on these straight coastlines drives the water up, and so the wind, the wind patterns here are mainly north to south. And this is also um, um, something that we can then model and um, uh, try to evaluate the consequences on the communities. So essentially, um, we come up to the conclusion that looking at oceanographic data, um, the summer conditions are pretty stable around uh, our uh, area. So you'll have north and northwest winds, meaning that the surface currents are running north to south. And uh, this drives the plowing events which uh, is not very good for tourism because the water is quite cold in the summer. And so you have much cooler water, around 15 degrees uh, average uh, near shore, whereas here, a few miles offshore, you'll have 18 or 90 degrees. So it's quite uh, a difference. But it's a stable pattern that you, you can find uh, almost every year in the summer. In the winter, however, things are quite different. And they are very much driven by the North Atlantic Oscillation which is um, a kind of oceanographic uh, feature pretty much like the El Niño La Niña uh, system. So it, it's driven by a big anticyclone anti system in the middle of the Atlantic that depending on its position will influ influence very differently things onshore. And so when the North Atlantic index is, um, is negative, what you have essentially is the winds coming from the south and southwest. So our winters are very wet and warm so warmer temperature, lots of rain coming from the south, and the surface currents are coming south to north. So if you recall during the summer, they will be coming north to south. And so when you have these um, types of winters with negative uh, um, NAO index, the surface currents will invert during the winter. And also, uh, as a consequence of this, uh, the waters near shore are warmer than in um, the other types of, wind, of winter. So in winter conditions with um, negative NAO, you have these types of um, um, drivers or um, conditions near shore influencing the faunas. However, when the North Atlantic um, oscillation is positive, you have um, a, a change in these patterns. So the winds will come from the north. This means that the winters here will be dry and very cool, much cooler than they are with the negative index, you can still have some upwelling events even during the winter, driven by uh, these uh, northerly winds, and the waters near shore are much cooler. 
And what happens to the, to the surface currents is that instead of they coming from south to north, they will invert. And so this gives us a very nice um, natural laboratory to try to understand how these changes impact the communities that we are studying near shore. So essentially we use basic methods like visual sensors um, and we will do this in a standard way throughout the years, trying to um, see how these communities change and how these uh, oceanographic patterns influence them. One important thing is that for each of these species will have their climatic affinities because of these distribution limits that are variable. You have species that can go from Scotland to South Africa, so they are unresponsive to these uh, issues. Whereas you have other species which stop in the region, either coming from the north or from the south, which are potentially much more responsive. So uh, this is just a standard method of uh, visual sensors that uh, we are doing to actually monitoring several aspects of biodiversity. We've been a focus on, on fish communities, but also on other uh, species in the, in the area. So the, uh, I'm going to bring you essentially two studies that we've done. One is older, which is this one where we found that um, winter sea conditions are really the, the main driver of very rapid shift in these coastal assemblages. And I'll talk a little bit about this uh, now. So when you look at the main um, oceanographic uh, patterns like, um, uh, or variables like sea surface temperature, uh, winds, and the North Atlantic index, and you, you plot them in a graph like this, you see that these two axes represent different uh, winter and summer conditions, and they separate quite clear those conditions. So we were used to talk about um, cold years and warm years, but we found out that uh, summer is quite unresponsible to these uh, changes. And so instead of talking about cold years and warm years, seasons must be analyzed separately because it, the conclusion is that the winter is the main driver of the change that we are observing here. And if you pull all the data together for one year, you don't get that signal. So it's the winter conditions that really influence this. And for you to be able to analyze it, uh, or to, to, to be able to plot this against the former uh, information, you have to analyze these seasons uh, separately. Uh, here you can see the NAO index, the SST and the South Wind during our 11 year period study that we did there. And so we were lucky enough to find uh, abrupt changes in the NAO index, as you can see here. And so essentially we had two cold water periods, which is these two here, and two warm water periods, which are these two over here. So you can see the NAO inverted in 96, 97, 98, and then inverted again in 2001. And so this gives us a very nice opportunity to try to see how these inversions in the oceanographic conditions would have impact on the faunas that uh, we were studying. Um, and another thing is that you see that these faunas respond differently to these changes. So uh, in this graph you can see that there is clearly a separation between um, the cold temperate group and the warm temperate and tropical group. So affinities, oceanographic affinities of these species, they are quite responsive to these changes, whereas the temperate species are not. And so this um, um, separation or these um, different responses of these uh, oceanographic, or, sorry, biogeographic groups um, and unresponsiveness of the temperate group um, tell us that we need also to consider distribution limits of the different species when analyzing this type of data for the assemblages, um, which was uh, an interesting conclusion of our uh, study. Another interesting thing is that if you plot just the fauna data, without the oceanographic data, uh, you can see that you find clearly two groups uh, that are actually related to the cold years and warm years. So just looking at the fauna data, you're finding the, the same patterns that you're looking at the oceanographic data, which is something very uh, surprising because it looks like the fauna is responding immediately to these changes. And uh, we think that this is due to a high proportion of the species in the assemblage have their distribution limits in the area. And so essentially through mortality or migration, probably mainly through mortality, this is uh, influencing a lot the composition of the communities around. And so this clear separation of uh, cold years and warm years on the uh, communities based on these faunal similarities 
was um, something that we would not expect to find, at least not in the, in the uh, immediate year after the changes occur, are occurring. So if you have a warm winter, uh, you would more or less know what you, you would expect to find in the community in the next year. Whereas if you have, uh, um, when you have these changes, you know, if you have a, a series of cold winters and then a, a warm winter comes, you'll see a big change in the community. And then if you have uh, two or three warm uh, winters and then an inversion in the conditions again, you'll uh, find that also in the forest. So essentially what we have here is the years um, where the NAO inverted on this side, so the warmer years, and here, here on this side you have the years where the NAO was um, yeah, the other way around. So on, when integrating these two um, types of data, so the oceanographic data and the faunistic data, we see a very, uh, well, quite a, a correlation between um, the winter conditions in the oceanographic data and the way the temperate and warm temperate group on one side and the cold temperate group on the other side respond to those uh, changes in oceanography. You know, oceanography. And so uh, it's not enough looking at the community as a whole. You need to know what are the biogeographic affinities of these species in these systems in order to, to try to understand why these changes are uh, occurring. Um, and this, this uh, Sorensen's index is essentially uh, what shows you, it's another confirmation of, of the data, shows you that when you have these abrupt changes uh, here in the index, you expect that something is occurring in the oceanographic uh, conditions that are impacting the assemblages that uh, you are uh, studying. And these are in line with the two warm periods that we, we found uh, when we were lucky enough to have this 11 year um, data set where these two changes came uh, during that period. Um, the second study I would like to uh, bring your attention to, uh, and probably I'll reserve some time in, in, um, afterwards so that we can um, get into this in more detail, is uh, um, a more recent one where we have uh, not only updated the uh, data set with more recent data, but we tried to model somehow how this um, the relationship between the oceanographic conditions and the, um, the fish communities or the fish assemblages uh, compositions are um, um, impacting these uh, type, these, these temperate regions where we have been uh, doing this research. And so here we, we essentially plotted again the climatic affinities of the fauna. We added uh, more recent data uh, to the data set and uh, we had more and um, uh, more reliable data and more detailed data uh, to try to model. So essentially we did this um, with two uh, types of approaches. So in one, we used a short term but high resolution spatial model. So it's a nine kilometer model um, where the data is available from 93 to 2011. And then we had uh, more ancient data from 1960 on, but um, the grid was much wider. So it's a one degree grid uh, so we call this the long-term and regional scale, and we try to see how the communities relate to these two types of um, uh, data sets. So the short-term and high spatial resolution is um, uh, in a smaller grid for a shorter period of time, and the long-term and regional scale resolution is in a larger grid, but you can uh, get it to the last 50 years, which were something we would try to, to, to study. Um, so we used... Um, some standard methods and tested a, a range of variabilities on um, um, on variables like these: sea surface temperature, wind stress, sea surface height, uh, significant wave height, and chlorophyll a. Just to uh, these are the standard data that you can uh, extract from satellite satellite information to see which ones were more responsive. And we also looked at a range of variation, not only the average, but we look at the means and maximum, uh, the number of consecutive days with deviations, essentially to see uh, what was the best model that could explain um, or could use these types of variables. And again, we, we um, separately analyzed the winter and the summer because we had this previous work showing that foreigners were responding differently. Um, and then essentially we we just uh, modeled this to select the, the, the best of the models uh, using these variables uh, and then uh, plotting the fauna data uh, and seeing what would come up of this. 
So we have um, essentially two things. One descriptive model where with our data we have uh, basically look at the number of indicator species and we could find that most of the indicator species or all in this graph uh, are from temperate and warm temperate affinities. So it looks like that um, the cold water species is, and the temperate, uh, or the cold temperate species, it's the standard down there. And these more tropical and warm temperate are the ones who are popping up right now. So these are responding more than the, the others that uh, traditionally will be more uh, probably um, typical of these um, coastal sandwiches that um, we have. And then we have um, a predictive model where we use both the short term uh, high resolution and the long term um, uh, less resolution um, um, information. Uh, so the predictive power of the models is uh, quite acceptable. And we plotted this tropicalization index, uh, which is essentially the percentage of um, species with tropical affinity when compared to the percentage of species with cold temperate affinities. So it will give you an idea of change in affinity on the proportions of these two uh, types of, uh, of faunas. And um, when you look at the observed data, which are the crosses that you can see here, in compared to the model data, which are the, the dots, you can see that the model seems to explain well, fairly well, the changes that we are uh, observing in the, in the assemblages. And also this index um, shows you that um, that seems to be a, a good match between the uh, warm years, let's call it the warm winters that uh, we uh, found in 1996, 97, 98. You see an increase in this index in this period. And again, 2001, 2002, and you see another increase. The more recent data we have is from 2010, and it looks again that here conditions have been um, uh, related to an inversion on the NAO, on the North Atlantic Oscillation uh, Index. So um, what this seems to uh, be showing us is that um, this higher tropicalization index is correlated with the negative NAO conditions. So when the North Atlantic Oscillation inverts, you'll have uh, um, a change in the community with a higher proportion of tropical species or warm te temperate and tropical species showing up. Um, on these uh, coastal assemblages. Well, we try then to, uh, using the same model, extrapolate the data back because we have this very good correlation between the oceanographic condition and the faunas. So assuming that those oceanographic conditions back then were also uh, a good explanatory model for the faunas, we try to uh, pull the model uh, until 50 years back and see what, uh, what happened. Again, we plotted the tropical index and um, here, again, the crosses are our observational data, and uh, all the uh, dots you see here are um, the model uh, data. Of course, you lose signal when you go back a little bit, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it seems like there's the, these last two decades that we've been collecting data, uh, and this is in line with peop what people have been described um, in some other regions of the world, um, are showing an intensification on the number of years where this um, warm temperate and tropical fauna are showing up in these uh, fish assemblages uh, near shore. And so these last two decades uh, have shown a higher index um, of tropicalization. And so we can conclude that if this trend um, is stable, if you can find it in other temperate regions, and if you will uh, continue to uh, find it um, throughout the, the, the new uh, decades, probably what you will be assisting is um, of um, uh, a movement called um, uh, essentially a poleward movement of many species in these temperate regions, you know, with an invasion or a, with a, a showing up in our assemblages of um, species coming from um, other uh, environments which are much more warmer. Of course, the for these changes to be stable through time, you'll you'll need this um, thing to be stable also through time, meaning that uh, once you have an inversion of the index, it can wipe out all the warm temperate community. And so all the species that were there, even for two or three years, would essentially disappear when you have a very cold winter because probably of physiological stress and the species are not able to adapt. But the other hand, is, this is quite interesting because 
um, if these trends continue, there is lots of room for uh, adaptation of the, uh, the species, maybe to cold winter, which means that there are lots of things in this assemblage that could be changing um, that we don't, we're not aware of yet. And so it's uh, worthwhile to continue these types of um, uh, surveys in these temperate regions because um, they, um, are, they look like they are quite sensitive to uh, climate variation. And so um, <clears throat> in conclusion, in terms of the, the main uh, results we, we've, um, we've um, identified so far, um, the, the useful of um, looking at past trends is trying to not only validate your uh, conclusions, but also trying to see and predict what would you expect in the near future to be the, well, the new uh, conditions in, in these uh, coastal oceans. Um, the different climatic scenarios that uh, people are putting forth all point to um, a temperature warming that is affecting uh, the, the ocean as a whole, but where temperate regions, because of these um, uh, climatic affinities uh, variations, could be an interesting place to, um, to study these changes. Um, and um, they can have, of course, very potential very high impacts on several things, uh, on fisheries for sure, but on conservation as well. So if I try to think what would be the fauna of the marine park in two or three decades, we don't know. And how is the fauna going to be able to move? Is there are any, any other places where the fish can find some areas without fishing so that connectivity works through time? We also don't know. And so both on the, the impacts on trophic webs, on conservation and fisheries, um, this is um, quite high or potentially quite high. And um, in these temperate regions, not only in tropics or not, not only in the poles, we are seeing these stresses um, occurring. And so uh, this poleward movement of uh, species distribution limits, it's something that we are, um, people are describing more and more. Um, and so uh, people are showing that many of, the, of these coastal groups are uh, showing up in, sometimes in extreme uh, different environments. Uh, and I'll show you an example of this in a, in a minute. Um, and so the interesting th thing here is this. Um, on one side, transition zones are expected to be more variable. So you would expect species to be more adaptable to those variability because the variability is the norm in these uh, conditions. Uh, but many times this variability is, is cyclic. So it's somewhat predictable. You have variability, but you have some predictability as well. And with what looks like these um, trends in variation show is that you still have the variability, but probably the predictability is changing. And so the way the ways animals will go, will going to respond to more unpredictable uh, cycles, it's also an unknown. And so um, on the one hand, you expect these communities to be more resilient to climate change, but the, on the other hand, if these cyclic patterns are disturbed you can have significant impacts on um, these um, uh, coastal communities uh, in the future. And so uh, I would like to argue maybe that these temperate regions are also important uh, parameters for us to study these types of uh, changes in the, in the oceans. And these uh, two simple studies that I've uh, tried to bring to your attention to today are you know, just a small contribution to this um, uh, topic which is very important and could be very important for society as a whole, but it also it's also a, a very exciting time to you know to be actually uh, surveying these communities right now because it's happening now and we have um, the tools to study those and we also have the opportunities to use these natural experiments um, to try to understand a little bit a little bit more about what the future will look like. And uh, this is my last note on this study. Uh, this was a, a recent paper we put forth showing an extreme example of these changes. So this is a surgeon fish. I'm pretty sure you, you're familiar with this family. It's, uh, it doesn't occur in Europe. It doesn't occur in the Mediterranean. Uh, so the northern part, the northern distribution limit of this species is southern Morocco, which is Maybe, maybe a thousand kilometers away from Lisbon, something like that, uh, in much warmer waters. But we found one of these um, vagrant individuals in, uh, 
in the winter actually, 2007. And so again, this was a winter when you have these southern winds coming up. And so it looks like probably associated with rafting or garbage in the ocean or whatever, uh, these species are showing in our community. One interesting aspect of the, this movement changes is that uh, for most of these species, we, we, of these warm temperate species, we find the adults and not the juveniles. So they are not recruiting to the area as you know, normal recruitment process through larvae and juveniles growing and then the adults establishing. They are coming up as adults already. So there has to be some kind of um, transport system in the ocean facilitating these um, occurrences. Uh, and of course, with all the garbage down there and all the things that fish can associate with for a while and survive, if they come in an, an eddy with a, uh, you know, with a warm enough temperature, uh, probably that's uh, one of the possible explanation mechanisms for why we're seeing this, uh, you know, completely off limit um, type of example or extreme example in this case of this certain fish. Well, of course, we're looking for Nemo. Uh, <laughs> it hasn't shown up yet, but uh, we, we don't know um, when and if it will. Um, but anyhow, I think this is um, worthwhile to continue. We have been monitoring the communities throughout time as resources permit. We're trying to uh, you know, build this database um, in a stronger way. Most of this data that I've shown you today <coughs> is presence absence data. Uh, although there are a lot of um, careful things that you need to take care of when dealing with that type of data, we would like to have more uh, information with abundance as well. We have from some of the years, but not from all of them. And that's why here we just use the presence absence uh, with several safeguards um, in order to be able to do this. Well, and essentially, I think this is what I um, would like to bring to you today. And I hope that we can now um, spend some time discussing. And I'll just finish by acknowledging uh, my co-author and mentor, uh, Peter Almada. Uh, in spite of being uh, blind, um, uh, he born blind. He was one, one of what the most enlightened persons I've met. He was a marine biologist. And I would like to acknowledge him. And also um, a, a doctoral study of mine, uh, Barbara Orte Costa, who's her PhD with these uh, more recent data sets, and many of the analyses uh, were run by I heard. And now, uh, like any thank you, or in Portuguese, obrigado. Okay.